Right. So I get the impression that this paper was sort of, you know, made when, uh, when you have a psychologist, a software language engineer, and some safety, a program safety dude. They like just met, and then they were in a room, and they were like, "We should make something about uh, about uh, whether programming can be harmful." Um, uh, and they ask a lot of questions in this paper. We'll, you know, examine those questions. I just want to say also that I kind of. Um, took the, uh, or I kind of segmented it or tried to highlight the things that I thought was interesting. So the paper is much more, uh, and everyone should read, uh, should read it. Right, so the motivation. Um, so the, uh, the authors, uh, they, all, uh, they talk a lot about robotics in the intro. And there's a lot of work being done in safety regarding robotics. I mean, we don't want the Terminator future to actually happen, right? So. Um, we need to do some pre uh, proper research in that field. But can one port this, you know, this concept of program safety to software side, and in particular software uh, language and uh, you know, programming languages? So yeah, so the idea, uh, the question is whether or not software languages or programming languages can cause mental harm. Uh, to their users, and like the definition they're trying to go for with mental harm is more than minor or temporary impairment of mental facilities such as inflicting strong fear, terror, intimidation, or threat. So yeah, I hope none of you have like been terrorized by programming languages. Before we go any further, I can just tell you something that happened super recently to me. Um, so I was programming in JavaScript, and uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to like tell you what languages you should like or what you should fear, but uh, um, so I was working with the moment object. So it's like JavaScript and then dates on top of that. Not exactly the best combination. And so I thought the, uh, I thought the start off uh, method would just, like it was so intuitive to me that it would just return some value. But I'm afraid that's not the case. So what it does, it's immu uh, it's mu uh, it mutates the date. Uh, value. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to do a deep copy and then run the method to get like a new ref, you know, a new actual date object. Uh, so that's the correct way. And this made me quite upset and actually quite angry and yeah, sad. So uh, so yeah, just in case any designers are here, I thought I'd make this a bit more like I, I'd upset them by choosing two smileys with or emojis with different styles. Um, so question one. Uh, so in this uh, paper, they pose a lot of questions and they make the framework for um, the social experiments. And it's sort of like it, it expects future work for these questions to be answered. Um, and I'll go into why it's significant that these questions are answered, because they ha actually have real world implications. Anyway, so uh, question one. What are noticeable differences between the code written by programmers in different mental states? a happy programmer and a sad programmer. So uh, you can think about it in this way. If a sad programmer writes worse code, then that actually has financial um, consequences for the company in charge. And it would be more than just an ethical question. And that can be, uh, that is worth researching in its own right. Um, as for question number two, it's, um, is working in a particular language capable or, uh, of making a program less happy or even more depressed? Um, so I just put in PHP and JavaScript there. I'm not telling you what's good languages, stuff like that, but yeah. The paper, on the other hand, actually does use PHP as a, an example of a language which is, um, which is considered bad by the community. And it's like you have all these blogs which <laughs> PHP sadness, and like this one dude talking about his feelings, what, uh, that PHP makes him sad. You, you have uh, people asking if they failed in their career by choosing PHP. <laughs> and then you have this one person who's super angry at or he has a really clickbaity um, blog where he says that PHP is stupid and so are you for choosing it. The funny thing is that this bloke is doing no J the JS now, so he's going over the JavaScript. So what? <laughs> Um, but, you know, to each their own. On a more positive note, some programming languages um, actually, you know, help treat uh, depression. So this guy did uh, C++ and some JavaScript and HTML and CSS, and he, it really helped him. 
So, you know, reading through the references was actually a lot of fun. So I ended up just reading a lot of blog posts about people sharing their feelings about their programming languages. Um, right, so third question. Does knowing a particular language uh, cause direct harm in the, sense of, uh, in the sense of making a programmer worse? In other words, does like learning a new language, can learning a new language hurt you as a programmer? Of course, this sounds like it's taking out of Dijkstra and it actually quotes Dijkstra. So for those who don't know, Dijkstra is like one of the greatest uh, programmers, uh, or more correctly, I'd say, uh, computer science dudes to ever exist. He is, he is honestly just amazing, the coolest person ever. Um, but yeah, he, he usually said stuff like, is it, pr uh, practically, uh, it is practically impossible to teach good programming to students that have had prior exposure to basic. As potential programmers, they are mentally mutilated beyond hope of regeneration. So if you learn basic, you're just done. You can just like end your career now. You're never going to be a good programmer. Um, so you see the propaganda photos. This means we're going to talk a bit about Haskell, which is, in my opinion, the greatest thing to ever happen. Um, yeah, so question four. Does knowing a particular language cause indirect harm in the sense of making a person worse in communicating ideas and collaborating with others in the context of sof uh, software creation? And uh, let me tell you st another story. Uh, in my master's, I talked to this one guy who was even more into Haskell than I was, um, if that such a thing is possible. And he said that he basically s had to do Java programming and he tried to do monadic programming in Java. And I didn't think it was particularly pretty, let's put it like that. It was very verbose and very like, ugly and quite difficult to make sense of. So from my, my first thought was, yes, it can actually hurt you. Um, more Haskell propaganda <laughs> for those who aren't completely sold. Even more Haskell propaganda. Um, uh, yeah, so this paper actually is like quotes and says, for instance, learning Haskell can make a programmer demotivated since she will start to notice potential errors everywhere in imperative and or uh, untyped codes in other languages. And this is something that I personally, I work with dynamic languages in my everyday and it kind of hurts sometimes, like knowing that a type system would catch them. It's, uh, it's quite an experience. And then you have like other, uh, other people asking, you know, you spent all this time trying to learn Haskell and Prolog and all of these like well-designed languages during your studies. And now you're forced to work with what he calls the lowest common denominator. It, like, do you feel like, well, the effort you put in was worth it? And, uh, you know, a lot of people are kind of upset in this thread. So that was quite an interesting read as well. Um, so the fifth uh, question, can the, uh, can the first programming language learned by a programmer have any long-term effect like preventing the programmer to learn and effectively use new constructs and abstractions? So basically, your first language that you learn it, will it uh, hinder you or your development as a programmer? My first language was Java. That's what they taught in the university at the time. And I don't know, I thought it was actually quite an okay language to learn, but, uh, but there is this idea that you know, uh, learn, the first language impacts you. Uh, by the way, this guy, Dijkstra again, he, uh, he also have another amazing quote, which is the use of COPOL cripples the mind. Its teaching should therefore be regarded as criminal offense. It's, uh, he's quite the amazing dude. Yeah, so my final thoughts. Um, the idea of, or these questions should be answered because, okay, so if you take question one, um, which is, uh, which is uh, if the mental state of a programmer influences their uh, coding style or their code quality. So programming is a, you know, a, something you do with other people. So if you produce uh, bad code, this will impact other people. And them having to work with bad code, well, it will be like this evil spiral, which makes, you know, uh, which makes people sad. So that's not good. Also, um, if, you f uh, if the university, for example, I don't know, promotes some language which isn't well designed and it promotes depression in the, the students and then the students get into the industry and then they, you know, it spreads sort of. Uh, these kind of things uh, could have real uh, mental harm. So yeah, 
my final thoughts are read the paper. It's a lot of fun, and it's, you know, it, it's food for thoughts. You should think about these questions and reflect on them and see if they ever apply to you. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> questions? Um, well, yeah, I would actually. I think uh, sometimes people can be caught up in their own bubble, so they, you know, there's no other way. They're a bit dogmatic, so I don't try to write Haskell in JavaScript. Let's put it like this. Maybe I should. Perhaps. Uh, well, I hope everyone appreciates it. I mean, it's tackling informatics from another perspective, right? You have. You have these questions about, uh, about psychology and about uh, one thing that I think is completely taken out of the industry is fun. So why do I like Haskell? I find it fun to program in Haskell more so than any other language. It's just enjoyable. And in the industry, that's not something taken into account. You just, you know, you program in, the, in whatever you have or whatever is chosen for you. So, you know, these kind of questions can be a bit interesting. Anything else? Maya. With your newfound expertise in the subject, yes. um, do you think maybe it would make a difference if people didn't have like, a programming language that was reversed or sort of like, something like the programming paradox or a second game as a first source? So maybe when both like declarative or programming in Cosmos or maybe for example, like, so we had prologue and Haskell. But it's quite difficult to quantify like what's the best way of doing things and what does least the least amount of harm. So I think people yeah. would you know, people would like to have something yeah. where they can produce something at the so well. example the kind of harm that you're talking about is trying to trying to pass through your job. Yes. Yeah, well, I think the problem isn't the, the task itself. I think the problem is like being st stuck in this, you know, the only way to do things is idiomatically Haskell. So it's uh, more about, it's less, I think, about what you're supposed to program or what you're supposed to work on, but more on the idioms. So like uh, trying to, I'll get to you in a second, but uh, trying to get uh, idiom uh, idiomatic Haskell in Java, that's like, that's the root cause of the problem. And I think, I, I don't know, because I think he had to work with people, that uh, friend of mine, and uh, I think he ended up just doing the entire thing himself, more or less. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think that one uh, instance, it actually made real harm. Uh, about your question of uh, programming, but like teaching multiple, uh, sol or multiple perspectives on the problem, I think, uh, honestly, I, I have no answer to that. But I think we should have something which is quantifiable, right? So this paper puts a lot of thought and effort into the idea of how can we quantify the experiments? How can we conduct these experiments? How can we validate these experiments and, what, and so on? I, of course, focused on the questions because those are the most fun and you know, uh, flashy, you could say. But, uh, but uh, sure, I mean, you could definitely do that. And someone could probably come up with a good uh, measure of least amount of harm and some studies to back that up. But uh, I can't give you an answer to that. Arel? I just have a dumb question. Mm -hmm. If you have to do your job, isn't that basically corporate? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Uh, because the thing is, Kotlin, you can mutate variables and you can do a lot of dirty stuff that you can't do in Haskell. So, and you also can do a lot of, uh, you know. You, 
you can, like Kotlin, you can do more functional stuff, but it's not, Haskell is, okay, this devolved a lot into Haskell, and that wasn't the intention, but Haskell is unapologetically <laughs> functional. It's like only functional, it's only pure, you can't do these things, et cetera. You can't write classes, you can write structs, or, you know, the, the Haskell algebraic data types and stuff like that. And, uh, well, you can't do these things in Kotlin. It's, it's like Haskell is the extreme end, and that's what makes it so awesome. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Talk for me.